now. Today, I don't even need to ask the orb who we're talking about because we're going to be discussing Edgar Allan Poe. No other horror writer has had such a profound impact on the genre. Not even H.P. Lovecraft. In fact, really the only reason we describe some horror as Lovecraftian, but don't really describe any subset as Poean or Poesque or Poetic, is because all horror is influenced by Poe. You will not find a single modern horror writer who does not claim Poe as an influence. And if they don't, they are lying. Right, right, girl? Oh. How are you doing? No? What do you think about Poe Riker? Hmm? She's not a fan, apparently. All right, you can go. Whoop. We're trying with a microphone this time. See if this actually works. Now, admittedly, Lovecraft does have the more vocal fan base. And that's probably in large part because after Lovecraft's death, all his nerd friends lovingly cultivated his reputation to the point that today, most people won't even remember that he's racist or that he was racist. Meanwhile, Poe, after his death, somehow his arch nemesis, a fellow named Rufus Griswold, whom Poe had a huge falling out with over the 19th century equivalent of a posting war, somehow Rufus got hold of Poe's estate and became his executor and his biographer. And he spent the rest of his life convincing everyone that Poe was a lunatic jerkass who probably smelled bad. Still, not even the extremely mad, extremely wet, extremely red Rufus Griswold could dampen the public's enthusiasm for the dark and macabre tales of Edgar Allan Poe. Now, today, we usually think of Poe as a horror writer, and that's mostly what he was, but that does short shrift to Poe's range, because he also was a frequent writer of satire and humor, as well as the inventor of the detective and mystery stories, and a huge influence on early science fiction. Poe was the first American writer to make a living entirely by his writing. And that means, like today's modern content creators who are forced to piggyback on the latest memes for internet clicks, Poe was forced to cater to the fickle whims of the 19th century public to make his stories more enticing and keep that gravy train rolling, which is why Poe's stories often deal with things that are kind of weird to us, but were extremely hot back in the day, such as uh, hot air balloons, mesmerism, and mummies. But let's talk about Poe's horror work. Poe was writing in the then thriving Gothic tradition, even though a lot of his stories seem to be intended as rather sly satires of the genre. Now, what is Gothic? Gothic is a literary tradition uh, branching off from German Romanticism and Sturm und Drang. And the primary feature of Gothic is the sublime, that it stirs up emotions in the reader of such a raw and powerful nature that you feel as though you are being transported out of yourself. You forget that you are merely a reader of a novel, and the events as you read them become real to you, as if they were actually happening to you. Gothic literature is generally associated with very strong emotions, and very often we think of it as, uh, we think of 
gothic horror, which of course stirs up very strong emotions of fear and terror. But there are other gothic subgenres, for example, gothic romance, which instead feel, stirs up extreme feelings of horniness. Poe's primary innovation in Gothic literature was the addition of a psychological component. Madness, of course, is a common trope of the genre, but Poe was the first one to look at the madman as more than just a stock character. Poe's stories tend to probe deeper into the minds of madmen and criminals for an extra deliciously terrifying thrill that Victorian audiences uh, just could not get enough of, even in today still still add to the gothic melodrama of Poe's work. So what are some common features of the Poe story? Number one, big medieval castles. Now you might wonder why, how did gothic get its name? And the literature movement, as well as the artistic movement in general, got its name from Gothic architecture because many of these stories took place in large, crumbling Gothic castles and cathedrals. Many of Poe's stories take place in quasi-medieval times, sort of an ill-defined, almost fairy tale like setting, so it's not surprising to see a lot of castles in stories like Hop Frog or The Mask of the Red Death. In keeping with Poe's interest in the inner life of the individual, his castles often reflect the mental state of his protagonists, like the gaudy tryhard decorations of Prince Prospero's castle in Mask of the Red Death, or the crumbling edifice that literally signifies the fall of the House of Usher in The Fall of the House of Usher. Number two, the death of the beautiful woman. From the fall of the House of Usher to Lygia to the Black Cat, Poe sees the death of a beautiful woman as a uniquely tragic event. That's because in Poe stories, a beautiful woman is often a soothing and civilizing influence on her man. She's an angelic anchor that keeps her man from succumbing to his basest desires. So when a woman dies in a Poe story, it's not just that a woman has left us. It's not just the tragedy isn't just her own death. It's that she's left a man unmoored and untethered from society. Uh, in short, uh, Poe po tended to fridge a lot of his female characters, as we would say in the modern parlance of these times. Number three, the perfect crime. Oh boy, oh boy, I am going to commit the perfect crime because I am the perfect criminal to commit it. And I am going to tell you all about it in excruciating detail. Now, if you, like most of us, had to read the cask of Arma... Armantila... The, the, ca the cask of Amontillado back in high school 100 times, like they keep assigning it, your English teacher probably went on that lecture about how it is the example of a perfect revenge. And this is a common staple of a lot of Poe stories, where you'll find a Poe protagonist uh, detailing their extremely clever petty revenge scheme right down to the tiniest detail, telling you how they dotted every I and dashed every T, and there's absolutely no way that anything can go wrong. Now, yeah, that doesn't usually work out. Things usually go wrong for, for these guys. This really goes back to Poe's interest in the psychological life of his characters. And you'll see again and again, Poe is exploring what drives people to antisocial acts. And, and we'll find a lot of unreliable narrators, narrators who are who absolutely need you to understand that they are sane and normal, and instead, it is it is the society that is that is making them do stuff. Everyone else is is bad. 
Number four, premature burials. You'll see this in a lot of Poe stories. It happens in by on purpose in the cask of armadillo, but you'll also find it in um, a little more subtle uh, in the black cat, where it's not exactly the narrator's wife that's prematurely buried, but her cat. And of course, uh, in also in stories like Berenice and, well, the premature burial. I mean, that's kind of obvious that what that's about. So what's with all the premature uh, burial stories? This was a huge phobia in Victorian society. Everyone was really afraid they were just going to get buried. I mean, it's, it's pretty scary stuff. This was a big fear in Victorian society, partly because, well, you know, there are a lot of... Uh, a lot of epidemics and people are there are a lot of epidemics a lot of people being killed in these cities and just thrown willy-nilly into paupers graves and without the it, there was a feeling that death was a little more impersonal than it used to be you didn't have you know the the village gathering to make you know pay their last last respects in this modern uh victorian urban hellscape so there was a fear that uh trying to get rid of that body quickly you would just be thrown as a hole before your time and poe of course being very sensitive to the fears of his readers no doubt found this a perfect thing to cash in on and that's probably why we see a lot of it or it might be poe is just working through his own phobias there i mean either way it's pretty nasty stuff if you are mostly familiar with Poe from high school, then of course you've read The Mask of Armadillo. The Cask of Armadillo. Oops. How embarrassing. And of course you've read The Raven. But to really get a flavor for Poe's range and talents, you really owe it to yourself to seek out some of his more esoteric work because Poe can get pretty bonkers. His gothic stories are, are still pretty familiar to us today. They follow forms that we find familiar and in some odd ways even comforting when they scare us. But some of his uh, more sciencey fictiony stories are a little weirder. They probably made a lot of sense to his audience back in the day when science was somewhat in its infancy and public understanding of science was even more in its infancy. So some of the things that Poe writes about may have been plausible at the time. They may sound far-fetched, but not completely ridiculous. The idea that you could stop time by waving your hands in front of someone's face probably would have struck uh, Victorian audiences as like, yeah, sounds legit. Uh, although nowadays when you read that, it just sounds, sounds goofy. Uh, in fact, some of Poe's stories have almost become bizarro fiction with the passage of time. Um, if you don't believe me, I would recommend check out the visceral grossness of the facts in the case of M. Valdemar or the body horror satire, The Man That Was Used Up. And, and then you'll probably get a better sense of why every horror writer today still looks up to Poe. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our little look at Edgar Allan Poe. If you did, why don't you push the button that's somewhere on this website that will tell us, tell, wait, that won't tell you anything, but will cause you to follow or like or subscribe or whatever it does. I am told that's an important thing here on YouTube. Oh, wait a minute, I hear you say, I'm not watching this on YouTube. I am in fact watching this on public access television. In which case you can't do those things, but why not check out our Twitter account? It's midnight underscore pals. And we talk a lot more there about Edgar Allan Poe as well as other horror writers that you should probably be informed about. That's all for now. We'll see you next time. And until then, I'm Bitter Corella, and please enjoy your mortal coil. Goosebusters.